Every community has certain people, founders as we refer to them, whose lives have made such a difference in their community that they have permanently impacted the lives of future generations. Often, we only hear the names of these people. We see them on plaques, in statues, as names on the side of buildings and companies. During the next hour, you will have the rare opportunity to witness the story of an incredible person, a person who has made West Michigan what it is today. Welcome to West Michigan Biography. The story we share today is of a founder who lived in the West Michigan area his entire life. Starting in the family business at an early age, he, along with his brother, would see it develop into the prosperous and influential company that it has become today. He has continued to support the development of the Holland area in many ways. As an example, he had a strong influence on the Holland Harbor becoming an international port. His business knowledge has permitted him to serve on various boards throughout the area, most notably Grand Valley State University. Because of his moral background and personal integrity, he is highly respected by the people of West Michigan, including his business peers. We hope you will learn from and be inspired by this founder of West Michigan, Seymour Padnos. I am a child of two of parents who were immigrants. My father was born in Russia. My mother was born in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, my father came to the United States when he was a pro shortly after his bar mitzvah in that he went from, ran away from the Tsar's army to, uh, uh, across, without, alone. Uh, and uh, you have to know that conscription in the Tsar's army for Jewish kids uh, past 13 was 25 years. Uh, so there was a great incentive to get out. Um, he ended up, uh, he uh, walked and rode whenever he could find a road under the railroad cars and things like that. And uh, got to the, by the route of uh, a pedestrian, got to the Netherlands where he ran out of railroads and walks. And so he realized that he would then have to have enough money to pay steerage to the United States because that was his destination. And he lived in the Netherlands for a couple years, or I, we don't really know how long, sufficiently long that he picked up the Dutch language and was able to speak fairly intelligently. Um, my mother was about six years old when she was taken by her mother uh, from the port of Lat in Latvia uh, to the United States where her stepfather uh, already was uh, a resident and was provided for their means to get to the United States. Um, my father served in World War I and um, came home and met my mother, who was with her family by then. She, my mother was about 18 years old in Grand Rapids. And uh, they were married in um, 1919. Well, uh, to back up a little bit on my story, uh, I think in a, a, a very relevant part was how we ended up here in Holland, Michigan. Uh, my dad had come to the United States as an immigrant uh, 
strong, healthy, vigorous young man. And when he got off the boat in New York, apparently there were hiring agents that uh, afforded these young people, immigrants, a uh, source of income. And they signed my dad on to uh, work on one of the railroads out west, and they provided him with a ticket and, and, and uh, instructions. And so uh, he ended up somewhere out in Iowa, we think. And uh, he worked as a section hand on the railroad for a short period of time. But in those days, the railroads had a system uh, whereby you could leave your money on deposit, your earnings on deposit with the railroad, draw your necessities from the company store, and uh, cash out whenever you chose. Uh, somewhere down the road, my dad just discovered that uh, there was a lot of farming going on around his area where he was located. And uh, with his ability to and his knowledge of teaming and horses and that sort of thing, uh, he went to work for one of some of the f uh, farmers in the wheat harvest and uh, learned a, a, a bit more about the United States and the language and so forth. Uh, eventually, he decided to go off on his own and was able to get a pack for as a, as a peddler. And... Uh, family stories have it that he peddled to the Indians and slept with the Indians and ate with the Indians and uh, some stories sometimes, but uh, we don't have anybody to deny it, so I guess we have to believe it. <laughs> but he used to come to my house after my mother had passed away and tell these fanciful stories to our children at dinner. And it was magic, you know, it was, it was very, very interesting. And, and so that's as much as we know. We, we never queried my dad about uh, these things. They just kind of uh, dropped by the wayside. And, but dad learned how to uh, uh, break horses. He knew how to break horses from when he was a young man in Russia. And so he eventually bought wild horses and broke them and sold them. And uh, apparently came had a fair amount of money, at which point in time he decided it was appropriate for him to check in with the family whom he knew lived in Chicago. And so he uh, uh, went back to Chicago and found his brother and sister. And, uh, uh, was His sister had a large family and who, her husband was a blacksmith. She wanted my dad to, to leave his money with her because it was too dangerous for a young man carrying around a pocket full of money <laughs> in Chicago and uh, go to work for her husband as a blacksmith. Well, that wasn't exactly what my father had come to the United States for. And, and uh, that didn't last very long. So uh, he discovered there were people in Chicago who offered packs to peddlers and also offer, did, did some psychoanalytical analysis uh, to uh, feel where they could best fit. And so he was directed to Holland, Michigan because he spoke the Dutch language. He obviously learned that and, and uh, uh, he took the boat and came to Holland and that's, a, that's an interesting, interesting story there apparently. Uh, Makata was, was the first stop uh, of the Chicago boat. And uh, there were signs, no peddlers, no itinerants, no, no so forth allowed. And there was a man who was the primary in, in, in Makata who enforced the law by the name of Swan Miller, who owned the hotel there. And he put my dad right back on the boat. <laughs> so the next stop was Holland. And he was able to get off there, and he was walking down the street. Uh, obviously, an immigrant-looking kind of character, and not native to Holland. And uh, I have heard this since from uh, Ben Van Ralty, who was the grandson, I believe, or great-grandson of A.C. Van Ralty, 
who said he saw this fellow walking down the street and looking in shop windows, and there were a number of empty shop windows at that time. And so, and Ben had a, Ben happened to own a couple of them, and he was watching this man from the opposite side of the street and uh, walked across to him and addressed him. And my father responded in Dutch, which kind of shook him up. But my father had expected to talk to people in Dutch, you know, there. And uh, so uh, there was a camaraderie established uh, right away. And he offered my dad free rent in one of the stores, and he could live in there if he wished. And, and uh, when he could, then he would start paying. And, and uh, that was very common among the community in those days to help, and, uh, help the strangers. And uh, so he felt very comfortable here, and he started peddling to the uh, farm trade in and around Holland and discovered that they had no money. And so he bargained for whatever they happen to have, whether it be a calfskin or a cowhide or uh, bones, which they traded in those days because it was before plastics to use for buttons, um, uh, old metal rags, whatever they might have. Uh, and obviously he couldn't carry that all that far, so he had little depots along the way. I know there was one in Coopersville, for instance, and, and where he would just deposit stuff along the railroad track. Nobody ever disturbed it, you know. And uh, then if there was, apparently he waited until there was a sufficient quantity and loaded into railroad cars. And uh, it's interesting. Yes. But that got him on the, in the, into the barter business. Uh, eventually he opened a clothing store with his brother in Holland. With his parents firmly settled in Holland, Seymour grew up learning the value of hard work and friendships. Um, I was born in 1920 and uh, grew up in Holland. I, had a, I have a brother who's a year and a half younger than I am, um, and we went to the Holland Public Schools. and high school and so forth. And, and uh, then the question was, uh, you know, college, and there was never any question in my family. Uh, uh, education with many immigrants was primary. And so uh, no question about where you're going, you're going to go to college, just a question where. <laughs> it was uh, at a, in, in, I graduated in uh, 1939. And it was the, just, it was during the Depression still, but we were beginning to show signs of coming out of it with uh, the advent of World War II and, and lead lease and uh, the foundries in Muskegon were beginning to gear up again. And, and uh, many of the local industries were encouraged to change over to wartime contract production. And so things began to, look a little bit better and, and whereas I had helped my father in his business while I was in high school, uh, it seemed to make sense to go to Hope College where I could continue doing some of that and it was affordable. I, I hesitate to tell you that, but I think that tuition then for two semesters was well, like $120. And, and you know, uh, and I could live at home. Matter of fact, just going to a school here in Holland uh, was good in my later life because all the people I learned to know in school were the people whom I met later in life uh, on the street. Uh, Vernon Tenkade, for instance, taught me a, uh, a business law, and, and Bernard Ehrenshorst taught me accounting. And these are the people who were movers and shakers in Holland later uh, who were kindly disposed to me. So uh, attending Hope College was a education in itself because I think 
I was the only Jewish student that they'd ever had, and they were very, very accommodating. Um, as as uh, my father had certain anxiety, and one day early on in my freshman year, I came home and said, well, they've excused me from having to take the Bible course because it's their sense that my perception of the Bible is different than the way they taught it and so forth. And my dad said, well, do the other kids take the Bible course? And I said, oh, yeah, it's mandatory. And he said, well, you'll take it too. You know, and my, my dad was a very understanding, tolerant kind of a guy. And, and uh, it's been, you know, it worked out very, very well. World War II began while Seymour was in college. Like many young men of his time, he felt compelled to serve in the armed forces. I was a 39 high school graduate, which meant a 43 college graduate, which was right in the midst of the opening of World War II. And so uh, four of us, if I recall correctly, took our senior year at Northwestern University so to, uh, because we could go there in the summertime and accelerate our program. So Clinton Harrison and Harvey Coop and myself uh, chose to go to Northwestern and Cecil Batchelor. And uh, uh, the, the, we were able, as a matter of fact, uh, that spring, uh, we had sufficient enough co credits to graduate. So Hope College accommodated us by convening a baccalaureate for us. For, I think there were four of us that received our degrees and consequently, and by, by, we had previously enlisted. Uh, that, that spring it was obvious we were going to get drafted and so you had the option in those days that they had what they called ASP, Army Specialized Training Corps. And you could, if you got, they would let you stay in school until you got, your, got sufficient credits for graduation and then get called up right then. And so that spring, I was called up along with all the ASTP st students from Hope and Calvin and and um, Kalamazoo College, and uh, we, were all, we were a whole cadre of college students. Well, you can imagine what the drill sergeant faced with a bunch of smart Alex. But they had a system. The Army has a system. <laughs> they know how to deal with smart Alex. <laughs> we learned quick. <laughs> Well, we had enlisted for 42 months because we'd signed up earlier. So I don't know exactly. Uh, all I know is that at the end of my service career, I had 40, you got one point for every month of service. I had 42 points because that's all I, you got extra points for going overseas, you got extra points for battle stars and that sort of thing. And I never left the United States. And so uh, all around me were fellows getting discharged with 110 points and 120 points, you know, from the South Pacific. And, uh, and I, th I thought to myself, my golly, I'm going to be in the Army for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, it was, it was not too long after that that the Army really disbanded. And uh, uh, within months, not years, we, we were uh, discharged. After the war, Seymour and his brother found they wanted to continue working with the family business. They both soon realized it would take hard work and creativity to keep it successful and growing. Shortly after discharge from the service, I, I, I came home and I had wanted to go to grad school, but it became obvious that my mother and father were really tired uh, of the business and of the concerns for the business during the war and, 
and the OPA, you know, Office of Price Administration, pricing controls and and all of that sort of thing has to do with labor. Uh, my dad lost most of his employees because he didn't qualify for a defense shop. And, and they had special considerations for paying employees for the defense plants. And, uh, so I, and my brother, in addition, I should mention my brother was a prisoner of war, which uh, when you're a household of two children, that was a devastating thing for my parents to have gone through, and let alone to save my brother. But uh, uh, so I came back and went to work. And uh, my father made it very clear to my brother and myself that um, he was tired. He was tired of the everyday struggle and uh, wasn't terribly encouraging to us to uh, continue the business because as he characterized it, it's a tough and sometimes dirty and hard, labor-intense business. I had had enough of experience in the business uh, that I really didn't want to leave it. And besides which, Path of Least Resistance, resistance I had really no other place to go. <laughs> My brother, on the other hand, who joined me, was offered an opportunity to be in his wife's family furniture manufacturing business out in Boston, uh, who were manufacturers of very prestigious line of uh, um, antique reproduction furniture uh, on a par with Baker Furniture at that time. And, uh, uh, it, but it didn't take any great conviction. He decided his best, uh, m most rewarding opportunity was for the two of us together. And so we went about it, and we really didn't know a heck of a lot about it, but there were about a couple dozen employees and uh, an opportunity. We wandered in the dark for a while and uh, leaned upon people who my father had done business with uh, for a long time there was one of his friends in, up in Grand Haven who the Bastion Blessing Company made soda fountains and uh, that man always favored my dad and so we got on board and then there was another man uh, with the pet milk company uh, who had these condensaries around the country um, that we took advantage of, I guess. Another fellow down up in Muskegon at the Central Paper Mill and, you know, it was uh, trying to hold on to what my dad had. And let's be, uh, you ought to also be aware of the fact that because my dad was, I hesitate, hesitate to say this, but a very honorable person and could not take, you know, there were OPS ceiling prices on, their, on everything, just as there were butter and cream and meat and that sort of thing. And there were people who found ways to circumvent the regulations. Well, my, that wasn't my father's way of doing things. And as a consequence, he lost a lot of business because in many cases that had to do with being competitive. And so it was an uphill struggle. My brother and I drove truck. Uh, we did all the manual things that are required and little by little by little we made progress. Um, my brother primarily handled the uh, functions of the business, the manual work of the business, and I did the bookkeeping and, and merchandising. And uh, as he often has said to me, uh, when we bought new pieces of equipment, I haven't been inclined to take credit for that. He said, but that was your job, and that's the truth of the matter. That was my job. Uh, we improved on the wherewithal that my father had given us. We improved on the equipment, the transportation, the facilities. Uh, little by little, uh, we eventually 
uh, installed a, a larger baling machine for baling car bodies, and um, uh, from one thing to another, it just progressed. And uh, the next thing we know, we had a pretty good operating business. Even though work occupied the majority of his time, Seymour wanted to start a family. With the support of his friends and family, he was able to find the girl of his dreams. And uh, so along, uh, you know, um, all along the way, of course, my mother was greatly concerned about my rom romantic life, which didn't exist. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, and, and I imposed upon myself uh, a uh, inhibition to become involved with a Gentile girl. I, it was just something that just didn't seem to fit. And, and it, while I was at Hope College, I wasn't, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't a, a, a romantic guy. I was a student, and, and, uh, and I recognized that there were some barriers there, and I just didn't uh, go there. Uh, Everybody else was looking out for me, and uh, um, my father, my mother had a friend, a, a gentleman friend, who was a, pen, a traveling salesman, and every once in a while he would stop by from Grand Rapids, and he would have something to say about the young ladies in Grand Rapids and so forth. And One day, uh, speaking to my mother, uh, he mentioned a particular lady whom my mother knew because their family had a delicatessen in Grand Rapids and my mother used to pick up delicatessen goods once in a while and saw my wife working there. So and so she encouraged me. You just, you know, I should call that young lady. And I said, oh, she's just a child. She'll know, she is not gonna wanna go. You know, I was 27, I think, and she was about 19. and. I said, that's just, you know, that's not going to work. And so, uh, bug, 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 you know. Finally, I, I didn't really have the nerve to call her. So I called her brother, whom I knew, because I had belonged to a young man's, like CE, uh, only in a Jewish faith, and, and uh, he and I had gone to meetings together and so forth. And I said, do you think your sister would go out with me? You know, well, you know, I didn't know how quite to approach it. And uh, he said, you just call her, she'll go out with you. So I called her up and, and uh, she had a prior date and she said, well, she could go a different time. And uh, now then the question is, where do we go? You know, I'm not very, I'm not very comfortable with women to begin with. And the Shrine Circus was on in Grand Rapids. And so I got my brother and his wife to go with me on a double date to the Shrine Circus. And uh, she was very pleasant and nice to be with. And Esther and I were married on June 20th. Uh, we took our honeymoon at Isle Royal because it's a place I had always wanted to go and my wife, young as she was, had no idea where Isle Royal was. Well, Isle Royal in June is just barely free of ice. <laughs> and it was cold, and, but we did have a great time. And then uh, after Isle Royal, I, by good fortune, I made the good decision to go to, to, to Bacano Island at, and stayed at the Grand Hotel for a week. And that, that got me out of trouble. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and, and it's often talked about the, the scrap dealer's honeymoon because when we got, after we left Isle Royal, we went to Sault Ste. Marie where, of course, I had to stop and see the local scrap dealer, <laughs> Traders Iron and Metal Company, a man by the name of Wilfred Cohen, who, long and good memory, um, entertained us, couldn't have been nicer to us, happy to know the honeymooners, you know, 
Well, from Traverse City, uh, from uh, uh, Mackinac City, the next move was Traverse City, where we met a man by the name of Ginsburg, who had the scrap business in Traverse City. And then from there, we moved on down to Cadillac, where we met with a fellow. These are all friends of my father's, you know, people uh, by the name of Saul Young, who was the had been the mayor of Cadillac and was a real great guy, and he couldn't have been nicer to us. Uh, by that time, I was getting close enough to home, so I think we headed home. But we were gone for a couple of weeks, and, and it was a good experience. Uh, Esther and I uh, lived first in the uh, what is known as the Masonic Temple Building up on the fourth floor with an elevator that sometimes operated. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, but there were no homes available, and uh, we took what we could get. And we were awfully lucky that Harry Plagamers, who owned part of that, enabled us to get a, a, a locate there. And uh, we lived there for about a year before we, uh, uh, my father um, supported me in building a home buying a lot, building a whole pop on 26th Street, and we lived there for 26 years, and we were very fortunate there. We had just wonderful neighbors, uh, uh, Dr. Teasinger and his wife, and uh, Bill Butler uh, and his wife, and Henry Mentz and his wife, and just a good, good neighborhood. Uh, uh, what's the Van Dyke um, from Rooks Transfer, I can't. I can't think of his first name right now. But these were all great people, couldn't have been nicer to us. And, uh, you know, there was a certain amount of fear and trepidation, recognize the, the, the Jewish identity, and um, that, it all worked out. We proceeded to have four children. And uh, our eldest son, uh, Mitch, was born there, Holland Hospital, of course. Then came Shelley. And we've got some family movies. Every time we had a new movie, it was of a bringing a baby home. <laughs> then came Bill Padness and then Cindy. And uh, we're, uh, we're fortunate they were all healthy and uh, intelligent people. And they give me some grief because they, they are independent people. My wife reminds me of the fact that that's the way I taught them. Over the years, Seymour has developed many interests, but his favorite passion is sailing the waters of West Michigan. Uh, when we talk about what we do in our leisure time, and I've been a sailor almost all my life. Uh, I've had a series of sailboats uh, right now, I have a 40-foot uh, cruising sailboat that um, I'm able to use about three times a week in, 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 in my so-called somewhat retirement. And, uh, in a day, and, and I have some other things that I've spent my le leisure time doing. Uh, um, I'm a avid historian. Histor history collector, I think I better say it that way, because I'm not a historian. Um, and I collect first edition books of Holland and the, the Michigan and the Great Lakes, and, uh, and I have some outstanding pieces in my collection, um, which I find uh, enjoyable to just pull off the shelf once in a while and read some of these stories, these old stories about uh, immigrants and uh, community people early on. Well, I could, I could add to my story by saying that I was a stamp collector. Uh, I early on started with uh, stamps that were uh, uh, of, uh, from foreign countries. Uh, one of my mother's lady friend's husband was a chief engineer on Barbara Hutton's yacht, and they used to cruise around the Mediterranean in the wintertime, and, and this lady corresponded with my mother. Consequently, I got lots of uh, French and Italian, and uh, very picturesque, picturesque stamps. Uh, more la later on, I 
concentrated on U.S. stamps. And uh, However, I have since uh, given my stamp collection to the University of Michigan, uh, to the Clements Library there, where it's now part of the uh, graphics section. Seeing how successful West Michigan was becoming, Seymour chose to participate in its growth through various programs and boards. Along the way, uh, as things began to develop favorably for us, we found, my brother and I both found, opportunities to become com community involved. Um, we inherited from my father a inclination to want to be uh, uh, charitably disposed, uh, albeit that my father didn't have that much money to, uh, or a means to provide for community activities. Uh, that also improved and increased with our success in the business. Uh, my brother was very active, uh, served on the board of directors of the uh, uh, Board of Public Works. Uh, I was active in the founding of Windmill Island and uh, bringing the windmill to Holland and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, I used to take a lot of time. We had some very talented people advising us and uh, it, was, it was educational. I subsequently uh, was asked to be on the board of the First National Bank and Henry, to uh, credit Henry Mintz for giving me that opportunity and it was educational. It was educational as well as prestigious. Uh, we were very active in our trade association and my brother became president of a national trade association called the um, uh, National Association of Secondary Materials Industries and uh, I served on the board and active in an uh, alternate trade association. Um, I also served on the board of an international trade association uh, called the Bureau of International Recuperation, uh, called BIR, uh, uh, headquarters in Belgium, and, and uh, gave me uh, an opportunity to meet my uh, counterparts in other countries around the world and also to travel and see how they conducted themselves. I've often said that I wasn't a terribly originator, crafty originator, but I was a very good copier and, and, and uh, uh, it was healthy for our business. Um, recently, my brother and I were honored and by giving the Lifetime Achievement Award by our tra trade association, uh, which it it was awarded us in Las Vegas last spring, this spring. Um, you know, we've had our share of accolades and, and uh, we've also had, other, you know, we've had our lumps, but um, it's been a worthwhile life and as I said at this National Trade Association meeting, I can't think of a, any other place that I would have rather spent my life, uh, my life's vocation. Seymour's beliefs are in giving back from the success of his business. It has been an uh, opportunity and a pleasure to have known Don Lovers, the president of Grand Valley State University, and his successor. And, and uh, it also presented an opportunity uh, all those people who know Don Levers know that he uh, manifests these opportunities. Uh, uh, he uh, gave me the opportunity to uh, uh, provide a grant to the School of Engineering, uh, which was consequently named the Esther and Seymour Padness School of Engineering, and to put our name on one of the major structures at the campus in Allendale, which is the Padness Center, and 
so th those are all the benefits of uh, having worked and gained income that enabled us to do some nice things. Uh, so far as the Padness Company is concerned, uh, we have tried to take an enlightened attitude uh, in our relations with our employees to give these employees an opportunity to, to feel a partnership with us in the uh, success and profitability of the company. Uh, to that regard, uh, we have for 40 some years now had profit sharing, which is a, uh, a vehicle by which our employees do not put any of their own funds, but the company makes a grant every year from their profits to profit sharing contributions uh, for the benefit of the employees. And it, it is not the kind of a profit sharing plan where it's recallable. It is absolutely their property. Um, and uh, in addition to which, we provide scholarships for employees, uh, empl uh, children of employees, uh, to, uh, and by that we provide a certain amount of money to uh, enable them to pay their tuition uh, to go to college. And we've had a remarkable success with that. We've had, uh, as you know, our, our workforce is made up of a broad spectrum of people. We have a large proportion of Latino uh, and uh, uh, mem members of the Latino community. And we've been able to encourage uh, some of our Latino employees to send the kids to college whereas they might not have otherwise provided that. Holland is a vibrant community. Uh, Holland uh, is an attractive community. Uh, people who visit us and see all of our uh, the benefits of the community, the, our educational systems, our uh, uh, recreational facilities, as well as opportunities for employment, uh, have to be attracted to Holland. I, I, I think that uh, down the road, uh, Holland has to be cautious uh, about its growth uh, to uh, not to contain it, but to uh, not let it get out of control. Uh, I don't think Holland really wants another 28th Street, such as Grand Rapids has. Um, I, I think that what we have done has been well planned. They certainly, I, I look at the setbacks for the properties and the uh, attractive buildings that are being built and that sort of thing. That, that, that's good and healthy. Um, but we have to maintain that vigilance. Uh, I think Holland will grow. I think that uh, we are a very well-managed community. I think our Board of Public Works is a great uh, facility. Our hospital is an attractive facility. Our, and Hope College is, is a very attractive, uh, available means of education. Grand Valley in our backyard is affordable education. There are lots of things to uh, speak for Western Michigan. When I think of my life and the life I have spent in my education, the benefit of my education, the community, uh, I think that I've been favorably served. And I think that if I were to tell some, if I were to leave any kind of legacy uh, I, to the younger generation, I would like to be thought of as a hardworking, uh, down-to-earth individual. I think that uh, I would encourage young people, all my life I've been an optimist. All my life I have 
uh, been a pragmatist. I, I, by, by nature of my education and in my exposure, I'm a conservative. These are the kind of traits that I think young people uh, benefit, could benefit from. Um, I believe in my business practices. I've uh, used my judgment and, and my, uh, the information I've had available to me. Uh, I read a lot. I make, try to have as much information available to me as I can. I encourage young people to, to accept that kind of a philosophy. Um, I wouldn't want to say that I'm uh, better than uh, the average young person today. The same opportunities are there for them as they were for me. Uh, you have to work for it. All through my life, I've had people from whom I've benefited. I think of Dr. Dimnett at Hope College, who had a great influence on my life and, and my business life. Uh, I was a, a liberal arts graduate, but never uh, majoring in business, and uh, he taught me certain principles and ideas that have stayed with me all my life. I, I have a great many friends in the trade, who I am ever grateful to for their openness and, and willingness to share with me. It's been my experience that a person, a man, goes through life and very seldom has more than one or two confidants whom he can share his innermost secrets with. Um, I'm lucky in that regard that I've had people along the way. Um, it's been a great life.